You often hear about the inequalities facing women of color when it comes to medical care, but what about men of color? Studies show they're also facing higher death rates due to the lack of access and late diagnosis. Actor and advocate Boris Kojo, who's teamed up with Depends and the Prostate Cancer Foundation, is encouraging men to start paying better attention to your health. I think in our culture, um, there's a stigma attached to talking about these issues. Um, you know, weakness, vulnerability. Uh, I said earlier that uh, black men are under attack every day. You know, we're dealing with so much. There's so much on our shoulders. Uh, it's a, it's an ex it's an exhausting thing to constantly having to validate your existence. And you know, talking about these issues like prostate cancer uh, is another. You know, it's another potential uh, area of attack, you know, weakness that might be exposed. So um, we have um, uh, ignored it. We have ignored our own health, and um, we have uh, we have to get better. You know, we have to talk about these things. We have to, you know, insist on 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 getting access to quality care um, in order to get you know detected early. And then being able to be in a position to do something about it. Here with some facts about prostate cancer, especially for black men, our friend Dr. Jeffrey Sterling from Simcoe in uh, Illinois, I should say, managed preventative care. Thank you, doctor, for joining us. Appreciate it. Always good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Why are men so bad at taking care of themselves? I would like to think it's because we're busy. Um, it's hard to be proactive when you're constantly in survival mode. And part of what you said in the lead when talking about black women and health equity, it, most people don't know that of the top 10 causes of disease, black men actually fare poorer than black women on every single one of those. So for as much as the disparity exists across the race, it's even worse for black men. We're just busy and we're in survival mode. Well, that's why they say men live longer, specifically black men live longer, who have a significant other with them yes. because uh, we tend to, to keep them on their toes and take care of themselves. And you say they're busy. So what do they need to do to get within that busy life to start taking care of themselves, especially when it comes to prostate cancer? And tell me if this is true or not. If a man lives long enough, he'll get prostate cancer? Well, we certainly can say that the correlation exists between age. It actually is the biggest risk factor. Age is the largest risk factor in terms of developing prostate cancer. So the longer you live, the more likely you are to develop it. But it's very analogous to what women experience with breast cancer. There are about one, and one out of every seven and a half men in the United States will develop prostate cancer at some point in time during their life. And black men are actually above that. 50 to 80 times more likely to develop and be diagnosed with prostate cancer. So, yeah, you're lucky enough to live long enough, something's going to get you, and prostate cancer is one of the things that we really should be concerned with. Are black men more vulnerable to prostate cancer? Very much so. It, it's, it's the saddest and the oddest thing. We tend to get prostate cancer at a younger age. Hmm. We tend to have more advanced disease when it's found. And we tend to have a more severe type of prostate cancer than other men. So across the board, it, this is a bad diagnosis for us to get. Do we know why? Well, there's so many different things. And part of the reason why I would equivocate in answering that question is because the research on prostate cancer in African Americans is just so poor. Men, for a lot of the reasons that Boris mentioned and things that we know in medicine, we just tend not to have participated in the studies that delineate the causes and the path for prostate cancer. Do we not participate or are we not asked? A little bit of both, but again, this, there's a stigma involved with us participating in research in general, doing anything that involves digital examination. So there's a lot of reasons for us to not want to participate. We could theoretically lower the risk quite a bit just by taking better control of our health and demanding that we get a seat at the table. But fundamentally, it's critically important for us to be represented in these research studies because the protocols that are developed come out of those research projects. And in as much as we're only 5% of the population that's participating in these research studies, we can be confident that the findings of these studies actually apply to us. So when you then say, well, we're getting this disease more severely, more 
you know, early and there's a different level of pathology and, and severity, part of it is because, well, maybe we just didn't figure it out during the research trials. So black men have got to start getting involved in the research that tells us how to best treat this disease. I'm so tired of these and frustrated by these stigmas in the black community. Let's let's talk about COVID a little bit because Thanksgiving's approaching. Eventually the Christmas holiday will be here. Can we all gather and get together and say, hey, let's forget COVID or what? Well, you know, there's levels to this. Mm -hmm. If you and everyone in your family is vaccinated, then you should enjoy the holiday. There's rewards for doing what science suggests is the right thing. Right. So if, if you're sitting around a table of individuals that um, has full um, vaccination, then you're good to go. Now, I would still recommend that um, you just take some common sense measures because there is no 100% cure at this point. So in as much as you care to, um, whenever possible, social distancing, wearing masks, etc. Everything is about risk reduction, and in as much as you can lower the risk incrementally, continue to do so. But let's just start with that. If you're getting together for a family gathering and everyone is vaccinated, you're good to go. Enjoy yourselves. Do we and have we'll to wear our masks? Yeah. Well, it, technically you should, but you don't have to. It's really just a measure of what your risk tolerance is. There is no certainty. Now, what we will tell you to a medical certainty is that if you are in a room of individuals that are fully vaccinated, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. However, you know, even with a 99% certainty, one out of 100 people ends up having something bad happen to them. And then when you extrapolate that over millions of people, you start to see certain numbers that make people say, well, wait a minute, I thought that I was going to be safe. Yeah. So this is about risk reduction, not speaking in terms of absolutes. And let's not forget about kids. They're eligible now. What if the kids aren't vaccinated? Should they try to get vaccinated now in time for Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. They really should. I really wish that people would understand that kids actually represent the opportunity for us to slam the door on COVID-19. You're talking about 28 million people across the country that would really get us closer to that elusive theoretical concept of herd immunity so that we could lower the amount of COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, in the community. And the lower the amount of COVID-19 exists, the more likely it is to be safe to gather and to do all the other things. So even that is important enough. But then when you start talking about the reasons for kids themselves, we don't know about the long haul considerations, the long term right. side effects. And there are children who have died. So there's plenty of reasons to get them vaccinated for their own purposes. But overall, it really does represent the way in which we can close the door on this disease in the United States. All right, Dr. Jeffrey Sterling, thank you so much. Be safe, be well. You too. Happy okay. holidays. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.